Okay, first of all, thank you for coming to my session, first of the sessions for the day. Uh, so just before we start, guys, how many of you are using RabbitMQ or have heard about the message broker? Okay, three people. For the rest, no worries. Um, the first part of the session, we'll do a brief recap of the main inner workings of RabbitMQ. And then we'll go to the uh, core topic of our presentation, which is how to do high-load data processing using uh, RabbitMQ with the Spring Framework. So just before we start, a few short words about who I am. My name is Martin. I'm currently a Java freelancer, um, working through my own company called Coffee Cup Consulting. Uh, for the moment, I'm working with a company called Resolve Systems uh, that does security incident analytics. Uh, I'm also one of the guys who uh, helps organize events in the Bulgarian Java user group. We also have our own community Java conference, which runs in May, called JPrime. And I'm also a very big open JDK and Oracle database enthusiast. You can uh, tweet to me about anything related to messaging or open JDK. Just two years ago, I wrote a book about RabbitMQ that covers pretty much uh, all the details about the message broker, including various integrations with message brokers, enterprise service buses, uh, some details about the inner workings of RabbitMQ and so on. So if you're interested into the topic, you can uh, uh, reach me out after the session and I can share the book with you. Uh, for any questions, you can use Slido, as you know. Uh, basically, if you log into Slido.com, uh, this is the code you can use, R512, and you can write any questions during the session. We'll go over them uh, at the end of this talk. So we have fairly limited time. I'll be fairly fast with the first two sections. First, we'll cover some uh, messaging basics, just for, for all of us to be on the same topic in regard to messaging. Then we'll do some brief overview of how RabbitMQ works. And then we'll go to some interesting examples of how you can build a messaging, uh, a, a high load data processing pipeline using RabbitMQ and the Spring Integration Framework. How many of you have used Spring Framework for their projects? Several people. Uh, okay, we'll go into some uh, general details about how Spring integration works, what are the basic units, so you know how basically you can build your pipeline in a similar manner. So, messaging basics. Uh, these are, this is fairly basic information about messaging systems. Uh, typically, messaging provides, as most of you know, a mechanism for loosely coupled integration of various types of systems. And the central unit of processing is the message, which typically contains a header that provides the message metadata and some body that conveys the message data. Uh, typically, messaging may be, might be used for a number of use cases, not only high load data processing, but also other activities like aggregating different kinds of logs from multiple systems, uh, distributing and processing high loads of data, which is basically the focus of today's talk. And also it can be used for other use cases like, for example, offloading, long-running tasks, and so on and so on. You can find a number of use cases you can use messaging for. And there is also a variety of messaging protocols and solutions you can choose from. Uh, today we are, we are going to talk about RabbitMQ and the underlying AMQP protocol. But also you can use other solutions like Kafka, uh, MQTT, and so on and so forth. There is a variety of protocols. However, some of them imply vendor lock-in, meaning that if you go with this particular protocol or solution, you need to stick to that particular technology stack. For example, you choose uh, IBM Message Queue, then you typically need to stick with the, uh, with the IBM uh, technology stack. So there is also a, this diagram which provides a fairly basic comparison between the different messaging protocols. AMQP, which is basically the underlying protocol of RabbitMQ, has some specifics like the main goal uh, of AMQP, which is the protocol behind RabbitMQ, is to replace any type of proprietary protocol, meaning that the idea is that AMQP needs to be a general purpose protocol. The other protocols like MQTT, for example, is to be used for resource limited devices, mobile phones, any kind of IoT devices that have limited resources. Uh, Kafka, for example, has uh, the goal to process large volumes of stream data. And one of the questions that come, might come to your mind is why this talk about RabbitMQ and not Kafka? Well, there are reasons for that. And for me, one of the main reasons for you to choose RabbitMQ is simplicity compared to Kafka. Well, it always depends on the type of data you have and you need to process, because in some cases you might find RabbitMQ better fit for your data than Kafka or other messaging solution. 
Other uh, protocols like XMPP uh, and STOMP XMPP is XML based, so it's quite verbose. And STOMP basically is just plain text protocol that allows you to wrap other types of messaging protocols around it. And all of these protocols have different formats. AMQP and MQTT are binary protocols as long as the Kafka protocol as well. Uh, XMPP, as we said, is XML based and STOMP is text based. Uh, they have a variety of API methods you can use from. AMQP has around 40 methods uh, which are provided in the RabbitMQ implementation. Uh, Kafka already has uh, more than 40 methods uh, that you can choose from and so on and so forth. We'll not go into the details. In terms of reliability, most of those protocols provide some form of reliability. In particular, for uh, RabbitMQ, we have publisher and subscriber acknowledgements and transactions. You can create transactions in the whole message processing pipeline. And also, Kafka provides the same, typically similar mechanisms like acknowledgements and partitioning over the various Kafka nodes. In terms of extensibility though, AMQP provides some extension points, while for Kafka you don't have clear definition of extension points. So you can use that, that diagram to basically have a general comparison of the various messaging protocols. Now, as we said, there is a variety of brokers that implement those protocols. Uh, the focus of our session is RabbitMQ, of course. And there are some common broker characteristics that you can find among all of those solutions. So, in particular, all of them provide a mechanism for secure message transfer. If we go back to the diagram, you can see that most of them provide at least some form of uh, TLS-enabled uh, communication and some basic form of for authenticating uh, between the parties, like SASL authentication. Specifically for RabbitMQ and Kafka, we have both SASL for authentication and uh, TLS support for the transfer of messages. They also provide message routing and persistence, meaning that at the level of the message block, you can persist messages so that if the broker crashes, these messages can be brought up when it's restarted. That's provided by most solutions. And also, most all of the brokers provide a way for subscribers to subscribe and to keep track of those subscribers. These are just some common characteristics for the brokers. Now, let's go specifically about RabbitMQ and see what, what are the specifics of the RabbitMQ message broker. Uh, it's an open source message broker written in Erlang. Uh, basically, the, one of the advantages of Erlang is that it's a message passing uh, language, meaning that we don't have locking like in the JVM. But in the Erlang virtual machine, all the communication between processes happens with message passing, which basically makes it uh, much more easier to use in order to create distributed systems uh, than the JVM. The other thing is that the RabbitMQ protocol implements, uh, the RabbitMQ broker implements the MQP protocol or the advanced message queuing protocol. As we said, it's a general purpose protocol that might be implemented by other message brokers, but at present, RabbitMQ is the uh, main implementation of the protocol. And the broker also has pluggable architecture, meaning that it provides also, it can provide support for other messaging protocols and protocols in general. For the moment, there are standard plugins for stop MQTT, and HTTP transfer of messages. And the other thing about the MQP is that it's a binary protocol uh, which aims to standardize middleware communication. It's derived its origin from the financial industry. And basically, one of the specific things about the MQP is that it defines multiple virtual channels inside the same TCP connection. Uh, the ideology behind this protocol is that it's fairly expensive to create multiple TCP connections to send messages or to consume messages from the broker. And for that reason, the, the protocol defines the so-called virtual channels uh, inside a single TCP connection. This basically reduces the overhead of creating uh, TCP connections, meaning that you don't have to do the TCP handshake every time, but you just create one TCP connection to the message broker and you can use it for multiple purposes. Uh, the same idea basically is underlying the HTTP2 protocol, uh, which as you know is a new implementation of the HTTP protocol. And basically the idea is very similar, to optimize, uh, the to minimize the overhead uh, between communicating parties. Some of the characteristics that AMQP defines are several entities. We have exchanges, these are the endpoints on RabbitMQ where messages uh, are, to which messages are sent. 
When a message is received on an exchange, it is delivered to one or more queues, which are basically the persistent mechanisms in RabbitMQ that store the messages. And in order to establish the con connection between exchanges and queues, you can use bindings. Bindings basically define the routing rules within the message broker to transfer messages from the exchanges to the queues. And the other thing is that the MQP protocol is programmable, meaning that you can create all three types of entities through your programming language. For example, if you use the Java API for RabbitMQ, you can create those types of elements through the uh, Java client library. Uh, so each message can be published with a routing key, which is specified in the message header. And each binding between an exchange and a queue within the broker has a binding key. And the routing of the message to one or more queues is based between a matching on that routing key and binding key. So that's specified on the message, that's in the broker, and there should be some kind of matching so that we know to which queue we want to transfer that message in the message broker. We'll see some examples of that. RabbitMQ provides different types of exchanges based on the routing capabilities. We have direct or default exchange, which just delivers one message to one queue in the broker. We have uh, fan out and topic exchange, which is basically multicast and broadcast type of communication. You can deliver one message uh, to one or more queues in the broker uh, with a fan out exchange. And with the topic exchange, basically, you deliver uh, one or more messages to just uh, one or more queues to in the message broker. And you also have a headers exchange where basically you can uh, transfer messages based on multiple message keys, not just one message key specified on, specified on the message. To give you a more concrete example using this diagram, for example, if you want to send a message from a publisher to the RabbitMQ broker, you send some message with, say, let's say, key, some message key called general and some payload. When the message comes to the default exchange in RabbitMQ, the default exchange checks uh, the message key and tries to find the queue with the exact same name as the message key. In that particular case, it routes the message to the general queue. And from that general queue, we have exactly one subscriber that consumes it. In RabbitMQ, you might have multiple subscribers to the same queue, but just one of them consumes the message. So basically, if you want to establish uh, publish subscribe to multiple subscribers, you need to use fan out exchange here at the level of the message broker. Direct exchange is pretty similar to a default exchange. In that particular case, however, we specify a message key which is bgeneral. And when that message is delivered to the direct exchange, the message key is compared to the binding between that exchange and some of the queues. In that particular case, we have a general queue which has a matching uh, with the binding key of bgeneral with the message payload. And that message is delivered to that general queue. It's pretty much similar to the default exchange, but we have now more complex matching between the message key and uh, the binding key here. Fanout exchange, as we said, basically delivers the message to any queue that has at least one binding to that exchange. We send a message to the lock exchange here, and all the queues here that have at least one binding to that exchange receive the message. So in that case, you, you establish a broadcast type of communication within the message broker. And a topic exchange is fair, a bit more complex. It establishes multicast type of communication, whereby the message key might be some pattern. And based on that pattern, we determine on which queues we want to deliver that message based on the binding key. In that particular case, the pattern here is warning.hash sign. And we have two queues which are bound to the lock exchange with warning. Uh, uh, severe and warning dot client, and basically we deliver to both of those queues that message. So this is how it, it works in general. Now, in terms of clustering capabilities, RabbitMQ clustering mechanism provides scalability in terms of the queues that you define. For example, you might have a cluster of three instances, and you might have ten queues, and each instance uh, of that cluster is responsible for handling exactly the messages for exactly one of those queues. Meaning that, for example, if that particular instance fails, you cannot consume the messages from those particular queues. And for that reason, we have an extension of that default scalability mechanism, which is called mirrored queues, which allows us to replicate the messages across cluster nodes. For example, you might replicate the messages from one particular cluster node to one or more nodes in, in the cluster. This is how RabbitMQ clustering works in general. So just to give you a brief overview of how the message broker works, uh, I'll show you a demo. 
So just before we go to, into the demo, uh, I'll start up the message broker. So when you install RabbitMQ, you'll see a fairly basic uh, installation directory. So the installation structure of RabbitMQ is fairly simple. You have the SBIN directory which provides all the tools and runnables that you can use for RabbitMQ. Also we have the uh, include directory which contains some header files, airline header files used by RabbitMQ. Uh, you have basically the plugins in the plugins directory. They are packaged as airline zip files with the easy extension. So basically you can put any plugins here in that directory and install them using uh, a utility called RabbitMQ plugins. And also in the DB directory, uh, by default, you can switch to another directory, of course, but here, all the information about persistent messages, exchanges, bindings, and queues that you have created is stored here. RabbitMQ uses a NoSQL database called Nija to store that kind of information along with the persistent messages. So now, now if I want basically to start up the message broker, uh, I'll go to the SBIN directory and I'll use the RabbitMQ server utility from com the command line. It's fairly simple. I'll just say RabbitMQ server uh, bat or SH depending on what operating system are you using. When RabbitMQ starts, by default it starts with several plugins enabled and one of them is the RabbitMQ management utility which is the basic uh, management UI for RabbitMQ. So, if you want basically to use the, the management utility, you need to go to localhost on port 5672. And when you open the management utility, basically, default login is guest guest, you can see, first of all, what are the number of instances in your cluster. In the, my particular case, I've just started one instance node. Uh, before that, I created two other instances of my cluster, but they are down, which you can see here from the UI. You can see what are the, the current connections to the message broker. We don't have any subscribers or publishers publishing to the message broker for the moment. We can see the virtual channels for all of those connections here in the channels tab. And we can see the, the types of entities that are created in the message broker. We can see the exchanges. We have some predefined exchanges by the message broker. We have one default, one direct, one fan out. You can use them, but pretty much most applications create their own types of exchanges so they don't use the predefined ones. Also, you can see what queues we have created. For the moment, I have just one queue which is on another node which is down. And from the uh, admin panel, basically, I can cre create also other entities like users, virtual hosts, or policies. Virtual hosts basically provide me with a, a mechanism, a multi-tenancy mechanism within the message broker. For example, if you have multiple applications in different domains that use the message broker, all of them can use different virtual domains or virtual hosts that separate the types of entities that those applications are, are using, such as exchanges, bindings, and so on. So now if I want basically to, to plug into the message broker, I can use simply the Java client API. Uh, in my particular uh, example, what I do, is I create two subscribers. There are instances of a class which I have created which is called competing receiver. Uh, I initialize those receivers. Uh, then for, uh, I, in a separate thread, I receive a message in each of those receivers. I consume message from the broker calling the receive method. And at the end, I destroy the receiver. So let's first go to the initialize method to see how do we initialize the subscriber. First, we create a connection factory instance, which is coming from the RabbitMQ Java library. This connection factory specifies the location of my message broker. In that particular case, it's on localhost. Out of that factory, I create a TCP connection calling the new connection method. And from that TCP connection, I create a virtual channel by calling the create channel method. So at that point, I have a virtual channel I can use to send messages to or to consume messages from. Now, in the receive step, basically, what I do, first I check that if my channel is null, I initialize subscriber. If I call the initialize method multiple times, basically, uh, if I try to create um, a subscription uh, or an entity in the message broker, like a queue, an exchange, and so on, the operation is idempotent, meaning that I cannot create the same queue multiple times. If it's already created in the message broker, then it won't be created again. So after I make sure that my subscriber is initialized, I declare a queue. I call channel queue declare and I specify the queue name. 
along with some parameters. And then I create a queuing consumer instance, which is basically is a blocking consumer on which I call the consumer.nextDelivery method. This is a blocking operation that waits for at least one message to become available at the message blocker. Then it's consumed, and at the end I just print out that message. So it's fairly simple, as you can see. Here, this operation, as we said, the queue declaration, just makes sure that I already have that queue defined in the message blocker. If I don't have the queue, I'll get an exception. So for that reason, I need to make sure every time that my queue uh, or my exchange is already created in the message broker. And at the end, I destroy basically the subscriber. First, uh, what I do is I just close the TCP connection. When I close the TCP connection, all virtual channels that are created in that connection are also closed, which is reasonable enough. So this is how I create the, the subscribers. And uh, in order to demonstrate how to use them, I'll also publish a message to the message broker. For the publishing part, uh, I basically create a sender, I initialize it, send a test message to the broker, and finally I destroy it. The initialize for the sender is the same as for the subscriber, so basically I just create a virtual channel for the publishing. In the send message, I also make sure that the queue to which I want to publish is created. Uh, in that particular case, I publish using the default exchange. And for the message key, I use the queue name, so that basically my message is delivered to the queue which I have declared. The queue is called event queue. So calling the basic publish method, I specify the exchange, the message key, and some additional parameters for the message, which are additional headers specified for the message, and the message payload. In that particular case, it's a stream of bytes. And at the end, when I send the message, I destroy my publisher uh, using pretty much the same mechanism as, as I did to destroy the subscriber. Okay, so if I publish now this message to the message broker and I go to RabbitMQ to the uh, management console, if I go here to queues, I can see that I have one queue created, which is event queue. And here in the ready tab, I can see that there is one unconsumed message in my message broker. Now, in order to consume it, I'll just start my, um, start my two receivers and I can see basically that just one of them receives the message and the other one blocks waiting for another message to be received on the message broker. Here now the ready tap is zero because my message is consumed. Uh, so as you can see basically using RabbitMQ like this is, is fairly straightforward and simple. Uh, however, um, if you want to build a much more complex messaging pipeline, you might want to use a more complex technology stack and for that reason, I'll show you basically how does the Spring Framework work with RabbitMQ, what are the integration points you can use in the Spring Framework to communicate with RabbitMQ, and how to build a message processing pipeline, which is a bit more complex. So the Spring Framework basically provides support for communicating with RabbitMQ in terms of, I would say, three, but it's now two distinct frameworks. The first one is the Spring KMQP framework, which is just an equivalent of the RabbitMQ Java client library. So the Spring Framework provides a separate library for communicating with the MQP protocol and RabbitMQ in particular. The other one is the Spring Integration Framework. And Spring Integration basically is an implementation uh, of a set of, st of standard enterprise integration patterns which are defined in a very notorious book. And those integration patterns provide you with the capability to create different routing mechanisms like splitter, router, and different entities that you can use in your message processing pipeline. And a while ago, Spring Framework also provided the so-called Spring XD framework, which was a big data processing framework. The idea behind Spring XD was to provide multiple integration points with different databases, message brokers, and so on and so forth. But eventually, for some reason, this framework was discontinued. It also provided integration points with the RabbitMQ message broker but it's no longer supported, so you're not uh, encouraged to use that framework. So in terms of uh, the Spring KMQP framework, it provides three main utilities you can use to integrate with the RabbitMQ message broker. The first one is the Rabbit Admin class, which is a Spring class that allows you to declare queues, exchanges, and bindings, pretty much like the Java client library, but using a slightly different syntax. You also have listener containers that allow you to create message listeners 
to the uh, RabbitMQ message broker. In the example that we saw, the operation for consuming messages was blocking. And the Java client library of RabbitMQ doesn't provide you with message listeners that allow you to asynchronously consume messages from the message broker. And to fill the gap, the Spring framework provides those listener containers for that reason. And the third utility that is provided by the Spring framework is called Rabbit Template. Rabbit Template basically is a class that allows you to send messages to the broker and uh, receive messages from the broker. So basically, it's utility that allows you to communicate with the message broker. Um, okay, so basically. Uh, you can use all these three types of entities either as directly through Java code or define them in the Spring XML or annotation-based configuration. Uh, if you want to use them through Java code, I'll show several examples. So the first one is basically how you can declare an exchange uh, in a queue uh, within the message broker. You create a connect caching connection factor, which is a Spring class, which is basically an equivalent of the connection factory from the Java client library. You declare a queue bin which basically represents your queue. You specify some name, which in that particular case is sample queue. You also create a topic exchange with some name. And then you use the Rabbit admin utility to, to declare that queue and that exchange in the message broker. Those two calls use the MQP protocol to create the queue and the exchange in the message broker. And then you create a binding between those two uh, using the declare binding method of Spring, uh, which basically uses a very simple DSL to create the binding between the exchange and the queue with some binding key. And in the end, you destroy the, the caching connection factory. So as you can see, fairly straightforward and simple to use the Rabbit Admin utility. It's also very simple to use to create a listener to your message broker. You again use caching connection factory to create the connection to the message broker. And then you create a simple message listener container out of that factory and a particular listener that implements the handle message method. And inside that handle message method, you can process all the messages that you receive from the message broker. Uh, and the other interesting thing about listeners in Spring is that you can specify multiple queues from which, which you want to consume messages. This is something that's not present in the Java client library, but here in the set queue names method, you can specify multiple queues on the message broker for, from which you want to consume your messages. Uh, and how to use the Rabbit template utility? Probably the simplest case. You create a Rabbit template instance specifying the caching connection factory instance to connect to the message broker. And in order to send a message, you just call the convert and send method where you specify the exchange name. The empty string here denotes the default exchange in RabbitMQ. Then you specify the message key and some payload for the message. You have several overloads of that method where you can pass additional parameters to the message. And all of those examples can be defined using Spring conf XML based configuration. It's pretty much sim similar to what we saw in the Java code, but it's less boilerplate code. And the reason you would like to choose this instead of the Java code configuration is that in that case you extract the configuration of your entities in the message broker in Spring configuration rather than pollute your business logic in the Java code. So preferably you define uh, those types of things using Spring configuration like this. So for example, to create basically, uh, to publish to, to, to a message, first we need to create a Rabbit template instance. Uh, and for that Rabbit template instance, you again specify the caching connection factory, the exchange name, and the routing key for the messages. This is how you can create a listener using the Rabbit listener container utility. Uh, and yeah, you can specify the listener uh, in terms of Java code, of course. And also you can define a listener using uh, Spring-based annotation. Uh, this is the Rabbit listener annotation where you specify just the queues. As you can see, this is a more succinct and short syntax to create a listener. So it's basically a matter of preference and what you use in your project, whether it's XML-based configuration or annotation-based configuration. And basically, if you don't want to use XML-based configuration, you can also use Spring Boot. So in terms of Spring Boot, you can define the different kinds of uh, Spring game QP entities as separate bins uh, in your Spring Boot application using this add bin annotation. In that particular case, I create a connection factory here using the connection factory method and an IMQP admin instance using another bin method. 
So you have several choices here on how you can use those utilities through the Spring framework. Now the other framework that provides integration with RabbitMQ is the Spring Integration Framework. And Spring Integration Framework provides several types of elements that you can use to communicate with the message worker. One of them is an inbound channel adapter, which is basically an, uh, a type of item in the Spring Integration Framework that allows you to receive messages from the message broker and an outbound channel adapter for sending messages to the message broker. And the other two entities are similar, inbound gateway and outbound gateway, which are used for request reply type of communication to the message broker. So now we'll basically using those utilities, we'll build a fairly simple uh, messaging pipeline. One example of how you, what you can use Spring integration for is, for example, to replicate messages from one queue on one instance of RabbitMQ to another instance of, uh, of the RabbitMQ message broker. For that reason, you can use a Spring integration channel, basically, which is a fairly simple pipeline. And on that channel, you define one inbound channel adapter that reads messages from the one RabbitMQ instance and pushes those messages from an up to an outbound channel adapter that delivers them to another RabbitMQ instance. This is probably one of the simplest use cases of Spring integration with RabbitMQ. And you can use it to replicate messages between two brokers. However, uh, in our scenario, basically we'll use a, a bit more complex pipeline. So in order to create this replication scenario, you can use solely Spring XML configuration. You define the two, two queues on the two brokers. Here, I don't specify different connection factories to the two brokers, just one. So basically, you can consider these are queues on the same RabbitMQ instance. And then I can create a template uh, that is used to deliver the messages. That template is used by the Spring Integration Utilities. And the, in order to create the inbound and outbound channel adapters here, you need to define two elements. First, the inbound channel adapter that specifies the Spring Integration channel to which it will deliver those messages. It specifies the RabbitMQ queue names from which it will consume the messages and the connection factory to the RabbitMQ message broker. And for the outbound channel adapter, I specify similar configuration. Again, the Spring Integration channel from which I'll get the messages, uh, the routing key to where I'll be delivering the messages, the exchange, and the AMQP or the Rabbit template instance that will be used to publish the messages. Now, in order to demonstrate this in some more uh, involved scenario, I'll basically build a message processing pipeline whereby I have an online shop which receives different types of orders. For example, I have four types of orders which are milk, bread, apples and rabbits. And when I receive those orders, I want to process each, each of them using different system or different basically external provider that basically is responsible for handling th those types of orders. So for each type of order, I'll define separate application that consumes basically those orders and processes them further. Uh, in order to build that pipeline with Spring Integration and RabbitMQ, what I need to do is basically uh, I'll have an order producer, which is basically some class that publishes orders to my uh, Spring Integration bus. And that order producer basically publishes those messages to a channel in Spring Integration. In that channel basically routes the messages to an order router, which is basically a Spring Integration class that basically, based on the type of message, delivers that particular order type to different integration channel. I have one channel for milk, one channel for bread, and so on. And out of those channels, I publish them through different outbound, outbound channel adapters, which are Spring Integration entities, to deliver those messages to different RabbitMQ queues. And when I deliver the different types of orders to different RabbitMQ queues, out of those, those queues, they are delivered to different applications. So this is how I can use basically uh, RabbitMQ to build uh, a distributed message processing pipeline. And now let's go into the code to see how, how this works in action. So the first thing I need, to, I'll show you is a fairly simple message, messaging processor that allows me to process messages to RabbitMQ. And in order to define the format of, of my messages, I'll use a fairly simple DSL, which, which basically shows you how a, an order looks like. So I have one order, which is of type bread, with quantity equals three. This is the quantity of breads I would like to process. Uh, and some price, unit price. I also have an order of type milk, apple, and rabbit, with uh, different quantities and prices. Uh, in order to be able to process that simple DSL, 
uh, I have a method called uh, read orders. I'll not look into the details, but basically it, it just parses that file and creates uh, instances of the order class. The order is a very simple bin that basically represents an order, as we saw it in the simple text file. And when I create those orders, I use a uh, Spring integration channel to send all of them to, to, one, to one particular message channel. I just call channel send and I send the, the order to that channel. My channel is called test channel. And now I can see how from here that test channel processes those messages. For that reason, I've defined all of my processing logic in Spring configuration. So if I open the Spring configuration and see how it works, the first thing to see basically is that I create a channel called test channel. And I also create separate Spring integration channels for processing of the different types of orders that I have in my list. Now, uh, my test channel basically, uh, for each of those channels for the orders, I create outbound channel adapters that publish the messages from them to RabbitMQ. And here what I do also, I create separate queues in RabbitMQ to handle the different types of messages. I use that simply with Spring configuration. And here in order to, to build the actual pipeline, what I do basically is that here I create a message router, which is Spring integration specific element that allows me to route messages from one channel to another. And for that router, I specify as input channel, the test channel, which receives all the messages. And a Spring expression language expression, which routes the messages based on the type of the message. For each message, I have a type field, field in the order, and I use that type field to route it to the particular order channel. So for example, here, if the type is milk, I'll route that message to the milk order channel, which I've already defined. As you might guess here, if I have an unknown type of order, for example, bananas, it won't be routed anywhere because I don't have a channel created for that. And when the message is uh, routed to that particular uh, channel here, uh, I bind this channel to an, uh, to an outbound channel adapter. So the bread order channel is bound to the bread byte order channel. The binding happens basically here, uh, when, where I create the outbound channel adapter. I specify that it will read messages from the uh, bread byte order channel, and it will send them over the default exchange with the message key of bread queue, meaning that it will be delivered to the bread queue which I've created in RabbitMQ. And that's pretty much, much it. As you can see, basically with uh, 50, 60 lines of XML code, I can build my message processing pipeline. Now, to see that in action, uh, if I run that example here, that reads the orders and publishes them through the messaging pipeline over RabbitMQ, if I go to the to the RabbitMQ admin, I can see basically that I have uh, queues created for the different types of orders, apple, bread, uh, milk, and rabbit. And in each of them, I have one unprocessed message because I don't have subscribers for the moment or client applications that consume those messages. However, you can see basically that the messages are here and are ready for consumption. Uh, okay, so let's imagine that we want to build a slightly more complex example. Let's say that we want to have uh, composite types of orders, which look like this. So I introduce another type of order in the system, which is composite. And that composite type may contain suborders, which are just a mix of orders of different types. Like let's say one composite order might have one rabbit order and uh, one bread order. So I want to now process this additional type of uh, composite order. In order to be able to support that or extend my system with that type, first of all, I need to go back to the configuration here and specify a new channel for that particular type of order. When I specify that channel, I want to bind it here uh, to an outbound channel adapter. And now basically that I want to send uh, the message to a to that particular uh, composite order channel. On that or composite order channel, I define a Spring integration utility called Splitter. Splitter basically in Spring integration allows me to take one message type and split it into multiple types of orders. So if I take 
uh, the composite order, I send it over to the splitter, it is split into multiple orders and sent over to the test channel again. And just to show you how does splitter work, splitter basically just takes one type of order and gets the child orders and sends them, each one of them, to the message processing pipeline. And uh, basically, uh, we also have one more complex scenario, but unfortunately our time is a bit over. So the third scenario I wanted to show is how you can define orders in terms of uh, images. So basically how you can use optical character recognition to parse order information from an image and to put that in RabbitMQ. So for that reason, you can use just the third utility basically, uh, which allows you to define a processor for a custom message type or a so-called converter in terms of Spring integration to convert, convert the image to a particular order instance and process that in the message pipeline yet with another type of order called image. So basically this demonstrated you how you can use the Spring integration utility with RabbitMQ to build a message processing pipeline and it basically provides convenient adapters for integrating with RabbitMQ. So I would advise you to, to prefer the Spring integration framework uh, in, in, instead of the Java client library. Uh, now, do we have some time for questions? Yeah, we have some time for questions. So if you can finish open yep. the slide. And if you have any questions to your speaker, you can ask them right now. Okay, first question is what what do you think about uh, ZMQ? ZMQ, I guess you mean 0MQ is the question. So 0MQ, just to clarify, uh, it also provides integration with the MQP message broker, but I, I haven't used it personally. I think it's uh, it's much less uh, used than RabbitMQ. And honestly, I cannot compare it directly, but yeah, you can, you can probably, if you have some experiences, we can discuss them after the session. And, but it basically provides also integration with MQP, but not so well integrated like RabbitMQ. There was the question in the call. Mm -hmm. They first validate using yeah, that schema. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For RabbitMQ, there is nothing like schema validation. If you want to build that, you need to build that in your publisher and consumer. So basically, if you want to achieve that with RabbitMQ, you need to build custom validation schema and share it among the customers and producers. But RabbitMQ out of the box doesn't provide this capability. Even through a plugin, I don't know a plugin that provides this schema validation capability. Uh, I see just one more question here. Can we define channel configuration without XML? So yes, we can do. Uh, so the channel configuration that we saw uh, with Spring integration can be defined directly through Java code, similar to how we can define RabbitMQ AMQP utilities in Spring integration. So the question is, the answer is yes, you can do that. But uh, probably you would still prefer to use XML as it's more clear to extract that configuration in an in Spring XML file. Oh, okay, so applause. Yeah. Okay, let's go. Thank you very much for your